At the end of this session, you will be able to describe meaning of legal blindness, distinguish between myths and facts of visual impairment, and explain types of visual impairment. Hi, I'm Professor Sujata Khan, and I'm going to talk about visual impairment. What I'm going to discuss is a brief overview of what is visual impairment, what are the different types of visual impairment, and how do we identify a child who may be at risk for visual impairment in a classroom. I'll begin with a story which maybe you have heard about before. There were some blind people who were asked to describe an elephant. One blind person who touched the tail of the elephant described the elephant as a rope. Another blind person who touched the leg of the elephant thought it was a trunk of a tree, while another person who touched the air of the elephant thought it was a fan. So what basically we are trying to say is that the blind people describe the world around them on the basis of what they feel with their fingers. So it becomes of paramount importance for us to bring the world to their hand. Let's look at different types of visual impairment. Generally people think that anybody who is visually impaired is totally blind, but that is not the case. Total blindness is one type of visual impairment when there is no sight and no perception of light. We have people who have a visual acuity of 20 by 200 or less than that and a visual field of 20 degrees or less. They are called legally blind. Commonly used term for visually impaired person is legal blindness. Let us understand what is legal blindness. A person is called legally blind if his visual acuity is less than 20 by 200 in better eye and his field of vision is less than 20 degrees. What do I mean by 20 by 200 visual equity? Visual equity is basically with what clarity a person can see. A normal sighted person, what he can see at a distance of 200 feet. A visually impaired person can see the same thing at a distance of 20 feet. That means he has to come so much closer to the object to see it. A visual field is what a person can see from right to left, which is 180 degree for a sighted person. But for a legally blind person, it is less than 20 degrees after correction in the better eye. A person is called legally blind because if he falls in that category, then he is entitled for all legal concessions meant for the visually impaired. Majority of visually impaired people come in the category of low vision persons. According to WHO, a low vision person is one who has a visual equity less than 20 by 60 to 20 by 200 and he has a visual field of more than 10 degrees up to 40 degrees in the better eye. Another definition of low vision is, a low vision person is one who has some vision and his visual efficiency can be improved with the help of optical aids, non-optical aids and environmental modifications. This definition has educational implications. It's more important for teachers to focus on what kind of optical aids, for example, magnifiers, lenses, specially designed glasses can be used which will help the child to see better. Non-optical aids, for example, large print books which can again help them to be included in a regular class. And environmental modifications, for example, you give him good contrast, you make him sit in a place where there is better lighting. With these modifications, a child's visual functioning can definitely be improved. Identify the fact or facts from the given statements. Blind people have sixth sense. A visually impaired person should not use his or her vision because it results in decaying of vision. A visually impaired person with progressive eye condition is someone whose eye condition gets increasingly worse in future. The last sentence is the correct fact, that is, a visually impaired person with progressive eye condition is someone whose eye condition gets increasingly worse in future. Let us gain more insights of myths and facts which most people possess about visually impaired persons. It's interesting to note that how many myths are associated with visual impairment. For example, people believe that if a person is low vision, he should not use his vision at all. On the contrary, a person who has limited vision, what we call the residual vision, should be encouraged to use it as much as possible. 
Many a times we observe children bringing their books too close to their eyes and we dissuade them from doing that, thinking that they will lose their whatever revision they have. Again, the fact is that they may be comfortable more in reading when they hold the book at a particular angle. So we should never stop them from doing so. Most people believe that those who have low vision will eventually lose their entire vision. But there are only some conditions which are progressive in nature where the vision will deteriorate as time goes by. But many eye conditions are as they are. They will continue to have that residual vision for all their life. So they should be encouraged to use their vision. A very common misconception attached with visually impaired is that they have a sixth sense. They can hear better, they can remember better, and this is absolutely absurd. They work so hard on compensating their visual loss by focusing on their other senses. It's not that they're born with some additional sixth sense or some additional extraordinary power. Different eye conditions have different implications. One of the most common thing that we see is loss of visual equity which means there is blurred vision. It is like watching out of a window which is not clean. Besides loss of visual equity, there could be loss of visual field. As I mentioned earlier, for a sighted person, the visual field is 180 degrees. But a person with visual impairment, he could be only able to see in the center and not on the sides. Then that is called peripheral loss. Or he could be able to see on the sides but not in the center, that is central loss. Many a times they are able to see half, which we call hemisphere loss. It could be that the person is able to see the upper half or on the sides. And there are scotomas. Scotomas means a person will have vision only in patches and rest of the things are all dark. So basically a person will not be able to get a clear picture of anything that he is looking at. Some people with visual impairment have problems in their color vision. They cannot see all the colors or they cannot see the different gradations in the color. There could be color confusion or the understanding of a lighter shade or a darker shade, they get confused there. Some people have problem in their contrast sensitivity. Now what is contrast sensitivity? When we see something against a good background, we are able to look at it carefully, immediately. Or if the contrast is not good, we can't notice it at times. But a person with visual impairment who has a problem with contrast sensitivity will not be able to see an object unless it is provided in the background of an absolute good contrast. Choose the correct options. Which of the following images depict central loss? This is the image of central loss. In central loss, a visually impaired person can see all the sides except center. The other image is of scotoma, where a visually impaired person has vision in patches. Which of the following images depict contrast sensitivity? This is the image of contrast sensitivity. In contrast sensitivity, a visually impaired person cannot see an object unless it is provided in the background of an absolute good contrast. The other image depicts hemisphere loss, where a visually impaired person could see only one half. Visual impairment brings with it a lot of implications for the visually impaired person. The most devastating fact for the blind is that his world becomes dark and he is very insecure, so it affects his mobility the most. His range and variety of experiences get so limited. He can never appreciate a beautiful scenery. He cannot understand what is the depth of an ocean. He cannot understand the enormity of a mountain. He loses the control over his environment. For example, I'm a teacher with students in front of me, and I'm a totally blind person. The students would quietly walk out of the class and I wouldn't even get to know about it. There are different factors which affect the implications of blindness. For example, if a person is congenitally blind, that means he's born with blindness, will have some implications. And a person who acquires blindness later in life, who is called adventitiously blind, will have different implications. For example, a person who was born with blindness would not know what he's missing. 
whereas a person who loses his vision later in life will have great psychological implications. Implications of visual impairment will depend on the degree of vision the person has. What is his visual equity? At what distance can the person can see? At what lighting condition can the person see? What is the size of object that a person can see? And what contrast sensitivity the person has? For example, a person can see if it is in the yellow background and the content is in black. But if the same content is written with blue on a red background, he cannot see it at all. So degree of vision will also have its implications. Finally, the eye condition. Whether the eye condition is progressive, which means slowly the person is losing his vision, or is it static. A child who has a progressive visual loss has to be trained in use of brain. If the condition is static and he has some residual vision, then maybe just large print is fine for him. Prevention is better than cure. So it's very important for a teacher to be very alert in the class if she sees some conditions or some mannerisms, some behaviors in a child that may reflect that a child has a problem in vision. For example, if a child is not able to read fluently, he takes a lot of pauses, maybe he has a problem in vision. A child may frown, may blink excessively, or may make, you know, uh, very uh, funny facial expressions while he's reading, or he may bring the book very close to his eye while he's reading. That tells us that there is definitely some problem with his vision. The teacher has to be alert to notice, is the child tilting his head while reading? Is he covering his one eye while he's looking at an object which may be at a certain distance? Is he extra sensitive to light? Like, he's able to see better when the light is dim, not always when the light is bright. The teacher may find one particular child always running out of his seat and coming close to the blackboard and copying down the notes. And the teacher may be just upset, you know, why is he not sitting in his place? But the point may be he's actually not able to see when he's sitting in his place, so he comes closer to the blackboard to take down the notes. A child may often complain of headaches or maybe tiredness after doing any visual work. So the teacher then has to give him breaks and not expect him to do any visual task for an extended period of time. If you observe this child, he may not be even walking smoothly. He may be tripping at every drop of a hat. So again, which tells us maybe there is some problem in his vision. There could also be some physical signs. For example, the two eyes don't look the same size. They're not symmetrical. There could be always uh, the child is having eye infections or there is a discharge coming from the eye. The eyes are swollen. All these are also physical indicators that maybe there is some visual impairment in the child. Think for a while and try to recall at least five signs of a person who is at risk of visual impairment. Check the below list and see whether you have added signs mentioned below. Difficulty in reading, skipping words or lines, may frown, excessive blinking, rubbing eyes frequently, having squint, showing facial distortion while reading, rereading or reading too slowly, may hold a book too close while reading, unable to see letters clearly, may complain of headache or tiredness after classwork, may bump into things. We must remember a child with visual impairment is more like any other child in the class than he is different from them. His needs are the same like any other child, but there are only some specific needs which come because of his visual impairment. For example, he needs more vivid description by the teacher. When you are introducing any topic, you have to be very structured and very systematic. For example, if we are talking about lakes and rivers in the class, now, for a visually impaired person to comprehend what is the difference between the lake and the river will be very difficult unless you give very vivid verbal explanations along with it. Most of the information that we take from our environment is through our visual mode. We can say for the blind, it becomes so much more difficult to understand and form the conception of the world around him through his fingers. So definitely he's going to take much more time to assimilate information. For that, the teacher has to be patient. For example, when I'm showing a model in the class, 
a sighted child will have one look at it and will understand what it is about. For the visually impaired, he has to understand the model part by part through his fingers and with your verbal description, then only he will form a correct concept of whatever you are trying to explain in the class. They need variety of experiences to understand different concepts. Unless we take them to different situations and explain how one is different from the other, they will not be able to generalize due to lack of vision. A very important need of a visually impaired person is his psychological need, a need for confidence building. Particularly for a person who has lost his vision later in life, the people around him, particularly the teacher, has to be very sensitive to give him that confidence that he can still do with support what he used to do earlier. A visually impaired person has no other disability unless there is an associated condition. So his cognitive functioning is as normal as anybody else's. So he will follow a regular curriculum. But besides the regular curriculum, a child with visual impairment will also need an expanded core curriculum, which means he will need a compensatory curriculum to compensate for his visual loss. To begin with, the first and the most important thing for any blind child at the early age is early stimulation to enhance his other senses, the sense of touch, which will lead him to the efficiency in reading and writing brain his auditory sense, which will help him to make sense of the world around him, particularly kinesthetic sense, gustatory sense, olfactory sense, all other senses need to be worked upon so that he can use those senses to make the sense of the world around him. A lot of effort has to be made in helping this child form his concepts about everyday life. We can give him a lot of real life experiences, use of concrete aids, which will aid in his understanding again of various things in the environment. Learning of Braille is crucial for any visually impaired person, particularly totally blind person. So Braille training has to begin very early in life. It starts with tactile enhancement and one has to go on focusing on how to teach the child Braille by creating a Braille environment so that, you know, like for example, a sighted child is curious to learn about language. For a blind, he doesn't know what Braille is. So we create an environment which creates a curiosity in him and then he starts learning what Braille is all about. We want the blind child to grow up with as much independence as anybody around him with vision. So we have to train him activities of daily living. He should not be dependent on others. For example, eating by himself, dressing by himself, moving about by himself. There are various techniques which will teach him how to move about gracefully, independently and with purpose. But for that, again, he has to be trained right from the beginning, which means we have to train him right in the beginning for all these aspects of development and not overlook them thinking that, oh, he will learn on his own. No, he needs structured intervention right from the beginning for different aspects of what we call expanded core curriculum. A child who has some vision, there the most important thing for him is to make use of that vision, what we call vision efficiency training program, meaning through a structured intervention, the child is trained in using that residual vision effectively and productively. There are a lot of assistive devices available for the visually impaired, which will help him in functioning as normal as possible in a class with the sighted children. For example, they use Brailler, they use Braille Slate, they use Taylor Frame to do math, they have Abacus to do math. For everything, there is a solution, there is something available. The only thing is we need to train these children to use it effectively for functioning normally in the classroom. Learning should be made fun and interesting for the visually impaired just the way it is for the sighted children. So we need to make use of a lot of tactile diagrams, models, embossed figures which will enable the visually impaired child to understand concepts better and enjoy the whole learning process. We live in the world of technology today and for the visually impaired also there is no dearth of technology. There is so much of technology which again helps a visually impaired person to become independent and as efficient as anybody else. For example, we have a software called JAWS software which is a screen reader. So when we put that software in the computer, anything that we do, the blind person can get an auditory input. 
A software called Magic Software helps a person with low vision. It enlarges the font size, it uses the color contrast uh, to which a visually impaired person could be most comfortable with. We can make the adjustments which helps the low vision person to see the screen more efficiently. We can help the low vision person with the use of this software. If my student is giving his assignment in Braille and I don't know Braille, not to worry about. There is Mountbatten Braille Writer which will transcribe Braille into text. A blind student wants to refer to a book but the book is not in Braille. What does he do then? There is Duxbury Transcriber which will transcribe print to Braille. So the solutions are there. We need to make people aware of them and we need to make good use of them. We've spoken about different implications of visual impairment. We've also spoken about what are the various facilities, what are the various devices available. At the same time, there are different concessions given by the government for their travel, for their postage. At a student level, they are allowed to take a writer, they are allowed to take extra time, they are allowed to take, uh, drop down certain subjects. See, the point that we want to stress upon here is that a blind person can live a life of a normal person only if the society provides them with all the support that they seek. They can live a life of dignity only if the people around them make them feel important, make them feel equipped, who can do just about anything that a sighted person can do. I want to end this with a famous quote by Helen Keller who said, the best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched, they must be felt with the heart. What it highlights is, a blind person can live to his maximum potential only depending upon how the people around him take care of him, love him and treat him.